So if we're going to do our leak check for our evaporator coil, we can take that panel off. Our meters usually have some kind of an adjustable end on it. This one has different adapters. And you can generally check in the vicinity to see if you have any refrigerant pulling up in there. But you are limited on what you can get to. So we can see if there's refrigerant in the general vicinity, but trying to pinpoint where that refrigerant leak is inside of this unit is going to be very difficult. Especially where we have all these U-bins in the front side, those same U-bins are in the back side. So we can only get so much. Now some units are nice enough to leave you enough room. We could take this panel off, you can slide this out and you can access more of it. But a lot of scenarios, we're going to have to take this entirely out to pressurize it separately. Now, once we've determined there's a leak in the evaporator coil, for residential, we'll typically have to replace that evaporator coil. However, in commercial situations, we're definitely going to be fixing those leaks. And there are some scenarios where you're going to have to fit, find where that leak is and fix that leak. So we're just going to go through some of those examples. Here I have my copper. I'm going to clean this up real quick. pull evaporator coil out, we have to pressure test it. So what we typically do is pinch these lines down around some kind of a trader end or valve core end so that we could pressurize that system. However, in the last year or so, I've come up with a new method that I kind of like better. So we have these sanded down, and what I do is I take these connections, I got a three quarter and also a three eighths, and I just simply pop it inside of one of these quick connects. So this slides in like so, locks into place, and then the other end, I'm just gonna press right on the three eighths copper here. Have the same thing for my three quarter copper. And I just leave this attached to my fitting and then I take the other side and I can press it right on the copper I'm working with. Now what's nice about this is when I'm done with it, I have a tool that will release this fitting off of here and then I can reuse this fitting for my next pressure test. Now, that's not what these are designed for, but I found that comes in very handy. That way I don't have to pinch and braze these off. It saves time with brazing. It saves time for pressure testing. And also I don't have to worry about losing any copper when I get ready to braze this back in, assuming we're gonna reinstall it. And for my trace gas, I'm gonna use some recovered refrigerant. That way I'm not wasting any of my good refrigerant, even though it's only just a couple ounces. I'm gonna make sure I get up to the vapor side, which is the hole at the very top. So I'll make sure I'm only getting vapor in. And I just pick a line and hook it up to it. We'll hook it up to, in this case, the 3 8 line. Just a quick little shot of refrigerant. That's all it takes. Now we're going to pressurize it with nitrogen. Now this evaporator coil is rated for a test pressure of 300 PSI. That's because I'm only testing this one component, I can pressurize it up to that. I'm not using my manifold gauge set at this point, so I'm just going to set my regulator to where I get to the 300 PSI point. So we're going to make sure this is backed out. We're going to open our nitrogen tank. We've got about 500 PSI in there. I'm going to increase my pressure regulator till I get it right at 300 PSI. We're right at 300 PSI. I'm going to open my valve, allow us to pressurize this coil. Now that we hear that noise stop, that gives us a good indication that our pressures have equalized. So I'm going to just shut my tank off. I'm going to close this valve off here. We're going to back a regulator out because we know we're not going to need that right now. And our Schrader port is leaking. So I'm going to take my valve cap. This valve cap has a Schrader core tool attached to it. Just give it a little bit of a tight and it stops. And I'm going to put the cap on just to make sure that we're not leaking. We'll turn on our leak detector. And even if I'm doing a coil clean, I still like to do these same exact connections because this keeps the system dry and tight. So I pressurize with nitrogen. I know that I'm not getting any moisture in there while I'm doing any other work. I also like to make sure I cap my refrigerant lines the same way, even if it's a plastic plug, just to keep as much moisture out of that system as possible. So our leak detector's fired up. We're in high sensitivity. It's gonna make that beep every once in a while and it's gonna be pulling an air sample here. So we're just gonna start going through very slowly moving through all of these connections. Because this is an infrared, we wanna make sure that we keep this moving. We don't wanna stop at any one point. Right here at the bottom is where we wanna make sure that we're careful because right here you have your condensation and that condensation can definitely ruin our very expensive leak detector.
So now that we know that we have a leak, what we're going to do is switch over to the bubbles leak detector. So I'm going to turn it to stream, this is my preference, and just start spraying some on here. And we can see that we have a nice significant leak right here at this point. The other option we have is a gas leak detector like this. It has a fluorescent to it, which shows up under a black light. But this is really thick also, we can put this on. And it makes a little bit better bubbles. We can also go over each one of these ends, coat it with this uh, gas leak detector. And this is also rated for a 32 degrees or zero degrees Celsius down to the freezing point. They make some of this product that's also rated at a lower temperature. So you can get some, if you're working in a walk-in cooler, walk-in freezer, you can get some that doesn't freeze until it's like minus 10. So that's the stuff we look for under those scenarios. But here we are, we found our leak. We'd want to continue searching to make sure that we don't have a leak anywhere else because we don't want to just stop at the first leak that we find. But trying to find a leak over here in the coil with this is very difficult because there's too much surface area. On this one, we can definitely soak up all of these points and it's very easy to see if we have something. And right here, you see that shoot out. There's a good size refrigerant leak there. The leak we showed earlier was quite significant, but if we had a very small leak, it would take time to show up. As we apply this fluid on here, there's gonna be bubbles showing up. So you have to give it time for it to settle. The existing bubbles, you may have to kind of rub your finger over to make sure that they flatten out so you can see if there's any new bubbles. And if we're patient and we wait, we can find that exactly where that leak is happening. But you can see trying to apply and check the whole entire coil with this leak detector would be very problematic. Now, one of the companies I worked for, we'd actually pressurize the system and we'd had a big tank at the shop. We'd take it back, we'd dump it inside that tank, and we'd sit there and look for any bubbles coming through. There's only been one company that had that did that, and it's really not practical to bring the coil all the way back to the shop and pressure test it, but sometimes you never know when you're gonna have to do extreme circumstances. Now, when it comes to the evaporator coil is leaking, typically you're gonna find leaks down here at the very bottom where these distribution tubes go into the evaporator coil. That's a very common place from the leak. It's also moist down here from all your condensation running off. You'll see that we have rust here. Rust isn't too big of a deal. We always want to note that in the invoice. It does show signs of aging, but rust itself isn't the problem. What you have is multiple metals here. We have copper, we have aluminum, we have steel, galvanized steel, and as you add water to that and air boom, you have electrolysis. And electrolysis starts eating away at these components, and you end up where you're having refrigerant leaks. Now, the next thing is, what about fixing that evaporator coil leak? Well, most of the time on residential systems, we're not gonna be fixing these coil leaks. We wanna identify where it's at, but most of the time you're looking at replacing that evaporator coil, whether it's under warranty or not. The problem is if one of these are leaking, that means it was all done in a factory in the perfect condition, flow, flowing nitrogen through. Now I have a leak in one of these connections. I bring my torch out, I heat up this connection to fix that leak. It's also gonna be heating up all of the other connections around it because of how close all these tubings are together. That ends up causing usually a leak in another spot. The risk for fixing an evaporator coil is very high. Doesn't mean that I haven't fixed leaks in evaporator coil, but the risk is high that you could have a leak someplace else in that system. So it's gonna be the customer's call. Do they wanna take that risk on trying to fix it? Uh, or are you just gonna go ahead and invest that money in something you know is not gonna have a problem, such as replacing an evaporator coil, or in some scenarios, replacing the entire piece of equipment? That's gonna be a conversation between you and your customer. Now, when it comes to commercial systems, you're much more likely to fix the leak. You have a few differences though. One is the tubing isn't nearly as close together. They're typically spread farther apart. It's easier to get to the different connections. Even your fins are spread farther apart. So on commercial systems, you also have, a lot of times you have to get that product up and running right now. You don't have any choice. So on a commercial system, you're gonna lose a food, you're gonna lose a walk-in freezer. You gotta get it fixed, whatever it takes as soon as possible, especially with supermarkets. It doesn't matter how it looks, you gotta get it up and running as quick as possible. So in some of those conditions, you will be fixing leaks in evaporator coil. So it isn't an easy thing to do, especially if it was in the tube and fence. So if we had a leak in the evaporator coil in one of these tubes, that's gonna be quite difficult for us to get to. If you see on this end how thick this is, there's a tubing here, tubing here, tubing here, tubing here. There's a lot of tubing. If that one in the very center was leaking in the middle, it would be very difficult for us to get to it. Even if we were to get to it, we have to cut away all this aluminum. By the time we cut away all this aluminum to get to that one piece of tubing, we now have a huge air hole and we have a major deficit in our heat transfer. Since we have this big hole here, the air is coming through it. It's what we call bypass. The air is bypassing the coil and we're not having that heat transfer. Even if you were to fill that hole with foam, you're still not having the heat transfer through that whole entire coil. 
Now, yes, in some scenarios we have to do this, or at least for temporary to get by, but it's certainly not an ideal situation. So let's give an example of what that would look like. Now we have our tenant safety goggles on, we should be wearing gloves, but we did move a bunch of the aluminum out of the way just to get to this one tube. Now imagine there's another set of tubes and yet another set of tubes on the other side. So if I wanted to fix a leak just in this one tube, I'm going to have to be very careful because as I heat this copper up, it's going to be heating up everything around it. Plus we still have to be able to get our sand cloth in there to clean this up. We put our tinted safety glasses on, we should be having gloves, but here I can only access this one tube. I can't get to the other tubes back there behind it. But if I wanted to fix the leak just in this one tube, I'd have to be careful because as my flame is throwing back in there, see how the flame's actually burning or igniting that aluminum? So for me to get the copper warm enough to actually fix a leak in any one of these locations, I'm also having to be careful because of the aluminum that I am burning. So here's a nice scenario of assuming that leak is right here in the front, easy to get to. But imagine if it's on the back side of this tube. It'd be much, much more difficult. So this tube's in pretty bad shape, but let's see if we can fix it anyways. I'm going to go ahead and just burn off all of that uh, bubble fluid that we put on there. We'll get that cleaned off. Then we can take a wire brush. This is just going to use the sand cloth, get this cleaned up nice and good. Let's say if we had a leak right here at this point. Notice how when my flame is close enough to heat up this one point, how it's also heating up all of these other tubes around it. That makes fixing these leaks quite difficult. So after we think we fixed our leak, we go ahead and do the same thing again. We add just a little bit of trace gas of refrigerant. Then we're going to add our nitrogen pressure behind that. And here we can already see that we have another leak. If we take our leak detector, it goes off instantly. If we take our bubbles, let's see where we're coming from. There we are. We're blowing out really hard right there at that one location. Right here is where it's coming from in this point. There's a lot of pressure coming out right there. We'll check the one that we did earlier. Then we'll double check it with our other bubbles. And we can see that that one's good. We don't see any bubbles. I want to take a little bit more time in this to really give it time to see if any small ones are going to come up. There's no big bubbles. Let's go back to that one in the front. There we are right here. We're just going to put a little mark in here so we know where it's at. And let's see if we can fix it. We're going to bleed our charge back off again. We're going to make an entire series just for brazing. This is just to give you an example. Again, we follow our same steps, and we only got about 200 PSI because our nitrogen tank is running low, but it should be enough for us to do this test. While our meter's warming up, let's go ahead and use the bubbles and see what we found. We already know where it's marked. I'm not immediately seeing anything. Let's go ahead and check with our meter. Looks like we did fix our leak. So we're going to bleed out our nitrogen pressure. Now there's two things I want to clarify because I do get cornered a lot. I'm not saying that we should go and be fixing leaks on these evaporator coils because there's a high risk that we could leak again. So it's a lot of times you're going to be losing money trying to repair leaks in evaporator coils, especially in residential systems. On the other hand, I'm not saying that you can't fix leaks on residential systems or commercial systems. In commercial systems, you're absolutely going to be fixing leaks in systems. Even if you order a new coil, you'll be fixing a leak just to get them by. 
I'm saying on residential systems, there is a high risk that it will leak again or be leaking someplace else. I have had very bad luck of fixing my leaks. I know they're solved and then it starts leaking someplace else again and again and again. I like to leave that up to the customer. I let the customer know. Sir, man, we can attempt to fix if there is no guarantee that we can fix this. Also, with the age of this system, if I fix this leak, we could end up causing a leak someplace else, or it could start leaking in another couple of days, or it may last for another several years. There is no guarantee, and there's a high risk on that. If you're willing to accept that risk with no guarantees, no warranties, then we'll give it a shot. On the other hand, it is a high risk. So as long as the customer understands that risk, hey, I have no problem trying to fix a leak. A lot of people just say, hey, leak and evaporator cool, they absolutely will not do it. I'm kind of in the middle on that. It depends on where it's at. I prefer in residential to go ahead and replace that coil. Make sure that we're in good condition because these things, like I say, they're always leaking, especially down here at the bottom sections. And more than likely, it's going to be a temporary solution. So as long as you understand those scenarios, you can fix leaks and evaporator coil. Is it the right decision? It depends on your circumstance. You got a walk-in freezer full of food, you're going to have to do something to get it going. Maybe that evaporator coils on back order and you got a elderly person there that they need cooling and you're going to have to do whatever it takes to get them cooling at least for a little while. There's many different scenarios. I'm not saying always do it one way or always do it the other. Understand the risks, but practice on an old piece first. Now they also make evaporator coils that are all aluminum, they're micro channel. I found that it's actually easier to fix a leak with the micro channel because it doesn't take near as much heat. It takes an entirely different type of process to make that happen. The problem with micro channel coil is it's most likely stopped up in those tubes because somebody didn't raise the nitrogen. The micro channels, the very small micro channels get clogged up. So fixing a leak in a micro channel is easy. The problem is with micro channel itself, they notorious for getting clogged up. So you're kind of back to the square one. These are just some of the things to work with. And again, before you try fixing a leak, go practice on the junkyard stuff first. Look, think how many times you could practice on this coil, all of these fittings, all these connections. If you really want to get good, take these U-bends out completely. If you really want to have fun with it, try cutting this metal loose because sometimes they'll leak right here where the copper and the metal touch. So practice cutting that metal out of there and try fixing a leak there. Great fun. You can have all kinds of fun with it uh, if you want to call it that. But that's something you can definitely practice on. This, the junkyard at the shop is a great way to practice. Get your hands on it before you ever have to need this in the field. And again, on commercial systems, there's going to be times you absolutely, without a doubt, are going to be fixing leaks on evaporator coils and condensing coils. But you have a different set of rules. And you're talking about food over comfort. So it's definitely a big deal. Anyways, that's just an example of what you're looking for, how you would pressure test an evaporator coil, why we can use higher pressure. And it's just one of tons of different examples it's just to give you an idea i'm not saying this is you should do it this particular way it's just to give you an idea how that system works